I am skipping a complete history of radiation to save time and I'm just going to share with you that in 1896 this Frenchman Henri Becquerel um, discovered that uranium salts would give off energy without any energy being put into them. This spontaneous, I don't do anything and energy comes off of them. Um, and he coined the name radioactivity for this. And it was a totally new event um, that, that you could not change the rate at which energy was emitted by physical means, by making it hot or cold or smashing it with a hammer. And you couldn't change the rate at which it gave off energy by chemical means, um, that by burning it or, or, or combining it chemically with other things, you couldn't neutralize it or stop it that this was something totally new. Here was a, a process where the energy was not a matter of the electron bonding, and it wasn't a matter of the molecular structure, but instead it was a matter of the nucleus. That there are several ways that a nucleus can give off energy, uh, called decay, fission, and fusion. Uh, I expect you to have a, a, an understanding of what decay means, which means very small little crumbs come off. Um, the biggest one you get is an alpha particle, a helium nucleus. We also get a beta particle, which is an electron coming out of the nucleus. How did an electron get in the nucleus in the first place? Or a gamma particle, which is actually electromagnetic radiation. This represents radiant energy coming out of the particle. There are others. You can have positron decay. Um, I, think, I think you can actually have neutron decay. Fission, a fissure, a crack, a breaking apart into two or more large pieces. Here would be one example that that's one that's going to be very important to us. Um, uranium-92 combines with a slow neutron. The slow, it turns out, is very important to us. This would get us up to your, the isotope of uranium, which is 236. It is not stable, and it breaks apart into these two large pieces. And I was going to go back and find out exactly what the atomic number of, this is clearly not right, but I didn't do my research. At any rate, this, this ought to add up to 92 here. So maybe this is like 40 and this is 52. Yeah, something like that. Sorry, messed up. Um, and three neutrons, and it's important that those neutrons are going fast because I want to use these neutrons that are given off to cause more uranium-92s to fission. And, and um, that's going to be a detail. Other times it breaks into other big pieces and sometimes it just gives off two neutrons. And here would be the energy that's given off, that spontaneous release of energy. Um, Fission is the combining of smaller nuclei to make a larger nucleus. Cool. Okay. So when any process goes on, be it nuclear, chemical, or, or, or just fallen down, um, it's always because the system is moving to a lower energy state. That is the direction in which things happen. So we are going to have this, these reactions go on, especially the decays, and, and they are going to proceed because they go to a lower energy state. But there is an impediment that you have to go to a higher energy state before you can get to that lower energy state, and so it's impossible. 
and yet it happens. Okay, let's look at this. Here would be the process of beta decay. This electron coming out of the nucleus, but I thought the nucleus was full of neutrons and protons. Well, it turns out that a neutron, if you get too many neutrons in the nucleus for the number of protons, they become unstable. And in fact, what happens is a down quark transitions into an up quark. And so instead of having a neutron in the nucleus, you now have an extra proton in the nucleus. But you also get, that would be a, this would add zero charge. This has charge of plus one. And we get this negative W boson keeps the charge conserved. The W boson is not stable. That's a gauge boson. And it decays into an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. And there's where that electron comes from in the nucleus. But to this graph here, an electron can't get out of the nucleus. That an electron is negative. It is attracted by the positive charges in the nucleus. It's not going to go away. There is this Coulomb barrier to it getting away. And yet it does. Beta decay does happen. And it happens because the electron borrows energy it doesn't have a right to, to get out. And then it can return the energy once it's out. So you have this tunneling event that goes on. And, and um, there is this delta E, delta T. So the de delta T speaks to the probability of you borrowing that energy. And that's where you get to the half-life. What are the odds of the electron getting out? They are not impossible. Um, in alpha decay, you have the n nucleons, the protons and neutrons of this alpha particle, being held to the remainder of the nucleus by strong force. And so now this barrier is not a Coulomb barrier, it's a strong force barrier. And the alpha particle can't get out of the nucleus. And yet it does. What does it do? It borrows the energy necessary and then returns it. Um, and, and so you have this, this matter of half-life with radioactive decay because of the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty uh, predicting when it is that you are going to get to borrow your energy. OK, nuclear fission, U-235. That's the isotope we looked at in the previous graph. It is very important. The primary isotope of uranium, 99 plus percent of the uranium you dig out of the ground, is U-238. And U-238 doesn't fission. But U-235 does. If a slow neutron goes into it, if it's going fast, it does not seem to get captured by the nucleus. But if it's going slow, it gets captured by the nucleus. And when it does, the nucleus becomes unstable. The, the competition between the Coulomb repulsion and the strong nuclear attraction causes this thing to start wobbling like a bowl full of jelly. I don't know if you've ever seen a bowl full of jelly wobble. And when it wobbles, it does this necking out. And here, these are still going to feel the electrostatic repulsion of positive and positive. But because they have gotten too far apart, the strong nuclear attraction is going to go away. And so because of this instability and the necking out, this thing busts apart into two particles and it gives off neutrons. But these are fast neutrons. Could be two, could be three. All kinds of fission reactions happen. And if I want these to cause another fission, I've got to slow them down. 
So that is one problem we need to deal with, how to slow them down so we can get a chain reaction. And the other problem is that this 235 makes up less than 1% of the uranium here. And so the odds are that these nuclei will find a 238. And then I get no chain reaction. Only if these neutrons, one, get slowed down, and two, find another 235, do I get another fissioning, and the reaction continues. With the 238, if it is a fast neutron, then it combines with the nucleus. I don't know why. Slow neutrons do not seem to combine with 238 nuclei. When it does, again you get a nucleus, but this time the instability is not the kind that sends it necking out so that it um, fissions, but instead what happens is this extra neutron or one of the neutrons in here decays. We get that, that down quark turning into an up quark and then the W boson and then the electron and the anti-electron neutrino and that electron then comes out. So you have beta decay and one more proton here in the nucleus. So now you're up to neptunium. And then the beta decay neptunium also is, is unstable and it's unstable in the sense that another down quark turns into an up quark and and gives off another electron and gains another proton, so you're up to plutonium. Well, that's important. Plutonium is a bad player. So it is unfortunate that when 238 captures a fast neutron, you get plutonium. We will talk more about that. Again, only less than 1% of the uranium that you dig out of the ground is the desirable isotope. And if you want a chain reaction to go forward, you're going to have to raise the percentage up to about 5%. And then there's enough 235s around that you can have a sustained chain reaction. And that is what we do in a power plant. That's nuclear power. If you were to enrich it up to 85%, then both or possibly all three of the neutrons coming off would find a 235 and so you would get an exponential growth in the rate of fissioning which leads to the explosion of, of a atomic bomb. A nuclear bomb uses fission. I'm sorry, uses fusion. That's called a hydrogen bomb as well and they fuse hydrogen to make helium, but um, it turns out that in a hydrogen bomb, the way they get it to fuse is by surrounding the, the, um, the weapon stuff with atomic bombs, which create enough energy to push the hydrogens together enough that they will fuse. So you end up with radioactivity from a hydrogen bomb because of all the atomic bombs that made it happen. So how do you get in uranium enriched to, uh, with enrichment? And all you have is this very small difference in mass. That is the only difference between undesirable uranium isotope and the desirable one. So what we will do, because mass is the only thing we've got to work with, cannot separate them by chemical means or physical means. Um, so what we're going to do is to turn the uranium, both types, into a gas called uranium hexafluoride. And then that gas will um, have all of the molecules, um, will warm it up which gives the molecules more kinetic energy. Every molecule gets the same kinetic energy. That's an equipartition issue. But the ones which have less mass are going to have greater velocity. Remember, kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. 
So the one with the bigger M is going to have smaller V if it's got the same kinetic energy. Slightly, so slightly faster. But then I will take that gas and I will diffuse it. And the one that is moving faster will diffuse slightly faster. It will move through this pipe slightly faster and after miles, literally miles of going through these pipes, the gas that comes out the other end will be slightly enriched in the 235. And that is the way that enrichment was done to build the American atomic bomb at Oak Ridge in the Manhattan Project. Um, the other way to separate the uranium is to um, put it in a centrifuge. We put the gas into the centrifuge and then spin it very fast and the slightly heavier um, 238 ends up at the outside of the spin. See that arrow for the spin down there. Um, the slightly lighter 235 hexafluoride ends up in the middle and we tap that middle off and then put it into another centrifuge. So this centrifuge is spinning. We tap from the middle to get the 235 and we put it into the next centrifuge and make it slightly more enriched in 235 and then put it into the next and put it into the next. It is a very difficult process to enrich uranium and that's why uranium fuel is so expensive. This image actually uh, was taken of a plant in Iran and this is our concern that maybe they're not just enriching the fuel to make fuel for their nuclear power plants. Maybe they're enriching it so much that they're trying to make a nuclear weapon and people argue about that. Nuclear power. Okay. So, various parts, and I want you to know them all. This is called the containment building. You can see it right there. And that's to keep us from crashing airplanes or driving trucks in or, or having earthquakes that come in and mess with this stuff. And it's also, if there were to be an accident in the radioactive material, this containment building would contain it keep it in, although that has not historically been the case where we've had meltdowns. Um, then you have this little pill here, which is called the reactor vessel. That is filled with water. This purple stuff is water, which has two rolls that the water picks up heat from the fission reactions and then when it passes through this chamber this water picks up that heat but hopefully keeping the radioactivity confined here and then that creates steam and we use the steam to push the turbine around and then this generator makes electricity. The These fat rectangles here are supposed to be the fuel. There's the uranium enriched in its 235 content that's going to be doing it. Well, the water serves a second function. In addition to heat exchange, it is the moderator. That the idea is that when a fission occurs here and it gives off fast neutrons, those neutrons will pass through the moderating water and as the neutrons bump into the water in those collisions that will slow the neutrons down so that when they get over to this fuel rod um, they will be going slow and can cause another fission. Um, in the original 
uh, atomic pile at the University of Chicago. They used graphite. At Chernobyl, they used graphite. Up in Canada, they use what's called heavy water. Here in Virginia, we use light water. But you need to have something between the fuel rods which will slow the neutrons down, moderate them. Then the last component are these control rods. And I am sorry that they have these here on the outside. I wish they had not drawn those. I would like just those three there sticking between the fuel rods. And a control rod soaks up, absorbs neutrons. When a neutron hits a control rod, it doesn't bounce off going slower. It disappears. It gets sucked up and you don't have any neutrons. And that's the way we control the rate of the reaction. That, that we can remove some neutrons by sticking the control rods further in. That will slow down the reaction, pull it out, and we can increase the amount of reaction. Um, if we stick the control rods all the way in, that would turn off the nuclear reactor. You get a scrub. What does this say? Oh, that's what I've just been saying. So there you are. If you want to stop the show and read that, you may. There is a big issue that I think we need to face, and that is what to do with the waste. Um, that as, as the nuclear fuel falls below 5%, Enrichment, it ceases to be useful as a fuel, and it, then it is waste. In Europe, what they do is they reprocess it. The problem is that in the process of reprocessing it, you get plutonium. And plutonium is probably the most dangerous substance there is. A smallest microscopic speck of plutonium being breathed in would, into your lungs, would with guaranteed cause a cancerous tumor. Um, that it is, and it's also much easier to make a bomb out of plutonium. You need less of it and you don't have to struggle with the whole enrichment issue. So in the United States during the Reagan administration, they decided that it was not safe for us to have plutonium and the United States ceased reprocessing. Um, in Europe, they feel like they can continue to do it safely. And in fact, they use the plutonium as a fissionable fuel. They put it back in when they've reprocessed it. It's called mixed oxide. And, and, and they uh, do that. Um, yeah. This should say 238, absorbing two neutrons. Ridiculous. At any rate, uranium-238 absorbing a neutron ultimately leads to having plutonium. The US, like the military, likes that. They have what they call breeder reactors whose purpose is to make plutonium. So that they can use it in making these bombs. Um, so in the U.S. we stopped reprocessing and so the option is to store it. And this was an understood necessity as the nuclear power plants are built. They always have a cooling pond associated with them where we can put, these are all the spent reactor fuel that when it gets too low they put it in here. It's still very radioactive maybe from that plutonium in it, but it's very radioactive and so it gets very hot and if you do not manage that heat, the rods will melt and then you have a big mess. Because I can grab these rods with a crane and move them around, but if it melts into a puddle, I can't deal with it. So we're very careful to control the temperature. We have these cooling ponds, but um, those cooling ponds are, are getting full. And so nowadays we are putting the spent fuel into these refrigerated uh, things on the surface, refrigerated casks. We're running out of room for these too. And there is a crisis in America 
of what are we going to do with this spent fuel? Well, the the and and the ideal thing would be to take it out of these ponds and out of these casks and store it at a, another location. It is very important that we be able to make it be a secure location. It's this barbed wire and I'm sure other security measures that we need to keep up with it for 10,000 years. That's how long it is a hazard. We don't want people stealing it and we don't want people inadvertently being hurt by it. The thought was that we would put it in underground out in Nevada, Yucca Mountain, but the Nevadans have, have uh, scotched that. They didn't like the idea. And uh, before they even did that, people like Ohio had passed laws saying you couldn't transport the spent fuel through our state on the way to Nevada. Well, there you go. It is a problem that needs to be resolved and we're counting on you people to do it because we haven't done it. Um, that uh, There's some good stories with this and maybe if we have time I can tell you them in class. Um, it's very important that when we store it, it stay there. We want it, wouldn't want it in an earthquake zone or a volcanic area. Um, we want it in a dry area. We don't want it getting flowing away and we don't want it getting into the groundwater. We want it away from people. How are we going to deal with it? Thank you.